scripture reading. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 1 to 16. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko and in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Damin between Soko and Ezekiel. Saul and Israelite assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his leg, he wore bronze cleaves and bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a reverse rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and light up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subject and serve us. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time, he was old and well advanced in years. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shema. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Now, verse 24 to 27, when the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. Now the Israelites has been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes his disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised? Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God. They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. Now verse 31 to 37. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. So replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy, and he has been fighting men from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock. I went after him, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it, 
by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. The uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the army of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. So said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. Now, uh, verse 41 to 49. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said and I give you flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I came against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the, the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistines moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. Now today, we have our privilege to have Ajahn Dan Jamaluddin from Australia. And he's a missionary sent by Australia and now uh, he has been, he and his family has been living in Thailand for the past six years. And he served as uh, an elder in, in Lachevi Church. Right? So we are honored to have you with us to share the words of God this morning. Please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you very much for that warm welcome. And it is a privilege to be here and to share God's word with you. Uh, may I just welcome anybody who has come to this church for the first time. You and I have something very much in common. Uh, it is my first time as well here. Uh, before we look at God's word this morning, let's commit this time to God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, for bringing us together this morning to reflect on who you are and what you've done that through your word we may know you more, that through your spirit we may be able to have our eyes, the eyes of our heart opened, uh, that we may respond with thanksgiving and praise, for you deserve our glory, your glory, for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Who likes to watch movies. A few people at the front, yeah. Uh, when was the last time you saw a movie at the cinema? T t 10 years ago, yeah. yeah. I have three kids, so it's been a while since I last saw a movie at the cinema. No, that's not true, kids' movies, I see. Uh, I like to watch action movies. I like to watch action movies because usually there's a struggle. Yeah? There's usually a battle between the righteous 
and the unrighteous. Uh, and there's usually a hero, uh, a hero that saves the day. And here are a couple of heroes. Let's see if anyone here can, can know, uh, knows who they are. So who, who knows who this character is? Okay. Katniss Everdeen. Yes, I, she's from The Hunger Games. Very good. Okay, this next hero might be a little bit more, more familiar. Uh, who knows who this character is? Oh, this one here. Superman, it's pretty easy, isn't it? I, liked, I like to watch action movies because ever since I was a young boy, I also wanted to be a hero. Okay. I wanted to be the hero who fights that battle and saves the day. Now, this morning, we're looking at what should be a very familiar battle. In some ways, it's the usual battle that we've come to expect in 1 Samuel. It's another battle between Israel and the Philistines. Uh, this clicker doesn't seem to be working. Can we skip to the next slide, thanks? Okay, thank you. Uh, it's another battle between the nation of Israel and the nation that God, the God that has graciously chosen for his own, and the nation of the Philistines, a nation that continues to defy God. But even in this familiar scene, it is in another way very, very different to the battles we've seen before leading up to this chapter. This is, in fact, a very different kind of battle. Because this time, it's not one army against another army. Right? Because this time, there is one person to represent each nation. So like Katniss Everdeen from Hunger Games, that person is to fight for their nation, on behalf of their nation. So what was to be a battle between armies is now like boxes in a Muay Thai arena. Yeah? And so we see that the Philistines have their representation. Their Philistines, the Philistines have their champion. And in verse 4, we see that their champion is Goliath. Goliath is a frightening soldier. First of all, he's huge. Yeah? He's a giant. He's around three meters tall, and his coat of armor weighs almost 60 kilos. He's like the rock in the movies Hercules. But this guy, Goliath, he's worse than the rock. Because unlike the rock, this guy is also covered in heavy, impenetrable armor. Every part of his body is covered except for his face. It's protected by armor. This frightening soldier is to fight for the Philistines. He is the perfect soldier. And if you're in a fight, this is the guy that you want to fight for you. But who is there to fight for the Israelites? Well, what we see in verse 11, if you have your Bibles open with you, is that after Goliath shouts and defies Israel, we read, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. You see, everyone is scared. Who is there to fight for the Israelites? There is no one. There is no one in Israel's army who can fight for the Israelites. But let's stop for a moment here and ask the question that we should be asking. The question we should be asking is, well, who should have been the one who fights for them? If we're familiar with the accounts leading up to this chapter of Samuel 1, we will see that back in chapter 8, that Israel asks the Lord God for a king. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 
19 to 20, we read Israel's response to Samuel, Samuel's request, request not to ask for a king. Israel responds to Samuel by saying, No, but there shall be a king over us, that we may also be like all the other nations, and that our king may judge us and go before us and fight our battles. So why does Israel ask the Lord for a king? So that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And in fact, their king, King Saul, is the closest person that Israel has to Goliath. It's mentioned twice in chapters 9 and 10 that Saul is the tallest man in Israel. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man, and uh, there was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. So Saul, Israel's king, is the closest person Israel has to the Philistines' Goliath. Saul, Israel's king, is the one in whom Israel wanted to go out before them and fight their battles. Saul is to be Israel's hope. Saul is to be Israel's salvation. But instead, what do we see? How do we see Israel's threat, Israel's hope respond to the Philistines' threat? Instead, we see that when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were, greatly, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. It is an absolutely helpless situation. There is no one in the Israelite army who can fight Goliath. And the nation of Israel are about to become slaves to the Philistines. It is at this point at this point of absolute helplessness, at the point of immediate threat of slavery, that along comes a hero. Along comes a different kind of hero, an unexpected hero. And we already know who that is, don't we? That hero, of course, is David. So how, does, how is David different from the rest of Israel. What makes him the hero that we are so familiar with? Well, first of all, and most importantly, David is different from the rest of Israel because of who he knows. David knows that his God is the true and living Lord God. We read in David saying in verse 26, For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You see, the God who David knows is not a statue, not like Goliath's God. The God who David knows is not made from wood or from stone or from metal, not like David's God. The God who David knows is not part of creation, not like Goliath's, uh, not like David's God, uh, not like, sorry, not like Goliath's God. Get my words mixed up here. The God who David knows is the true and living God of the universe. The God who David knows is the Creator, and because He is the living God. The God who acts in human history, David has seen his God working in his own life. And so from verses 34 to 37, we read, when David talks to Saul, he says, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. 
And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the, bo- from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. David trusts the Lord God to bring him victory. And with one stone, David defeats Goliath and cuts off his head. And this is usually where our Sunday school story of this passage usually ends. Yeah. But I wonder if we could, just for a moment, take a closer look at what is going on in this passage this morning. Let's take a closer look at who the real hero is here. Because if we look at this passage again, let's ask the question, who is it that actually does the fighting? Is it David? Is David the real hero? Let's have another look at verse 37. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And again in verse 46. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. So who does David say does the saving? The answer might surprise you. The answer might surprise you because you may have read this passage or even taught this passage many times. The answer might surprise you because you may even know the story off by heart. But you know, let me suggest that David is not the real hero in this passage. What we see here is that the living God, it is the living God who fights for his people. It is the living God who delivers his people. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. David knows that the same way the Lord has delivered him from the lion and the bear, so David knows that the Lord will deliver him from this Philistine. David knows that the Lord God will deliver him from God's enemy. David knows that the Lord God has delivered him. David knows that the Lord God will deliver him. It is the living God who fights for his people. In fact, this has always been the case. If we read in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 30, As Israel was supposed to enter the promised land on their first attempt, oh, I'm going too far here. Can we go back, please? There we go. The Lord your God who goes before you will he him, will himself fight for you just as he did in Egypt before your eyes. We see a similar pattern. God has delivered them from Egypt. God will deliver them into the promised land. And not only does the Lord God fight for and deliver his people, but the battle itself belongs under his sovereignty, under his rule. We read in verse 47, the Lord, for the Lord saves not with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's. So can you see? As terrifying as Goliath is to the Israelites, this is not a fair fight. This was never going to be a fair fight. Goliath thought he was fighting David, but in reality... He was actually fighting against the Lord Almighty. Now, sometimes I hear the comment that Christians think that the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. And this understanding usually comes about when there's not yet a good understanding of Scripture. But here is a good example, a great example, of how the Lord God is unchanging in his relationship with his people. The Lord God has always been the one and will always be the one who fights for and delivers his people. 
because as he himself fought and delivered Israel out of the hands of slavery from the Philistines, so too he himself, in the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, fought for and delivered us out of the hands of slavery from sin, from the domain of darkness. Now, last week, God's people all over the world were reminded that it is Jesus, God the Son himself, who fought the ultimate battle against Satan for us, and he has won. Jesus has conquered death. And being victorious, God has transferred us into his kingdom. And we read in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14, we read that he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You see, in reality, the reality is that I don't need to be the hero. I don't need to be the saviour. The world already has one. God the Son, Jesus, has already fought and won the battle that we could never win for ourselves. What has God done for you? Well, we, who are outside of God's chosen nation, the nation of Israel, well, we were all once like Goliath. We all defied the true and living God. We read in Romans chapter 3, no one is righteous, not, not even one. And further on in chapter, uh, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But now, God has delivered you from the domain of darkness. God has transferred you into the kingdom of his son. God has redeemed you. God has forgiven you. So now that God has saved us, what are we supposed to do now? Should we say, that's great, God, and then continue as we were before? Does a person who's, who, who has been saved from drowning want to go back to their previous state of being drowned? Well, we are to work this out, this salvation out in our lives. We are to live out this salvation. We are to demonstrate what this salvation looks like in our lives. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13, Paul writes to the Philippian church there, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God the Son has saved you. He has saved you out of slavery to sin, to be a holy and blameless people of God. God the Son has saved you. Now live out that salvation in your life. And as you live out that salvation, God will work in you to live out that salvation. So what are the amazing acts of God that he has done for you again? God has delivered you from the domain of darkness. God has transferred you to the kingdom of his son. God has redeemed you. God has forgiven you. Now let's pause on these things and let's consider how easy it is for us like the nation of Israel, to forget these mighty acts of God. How easy it is for us to listen to these truths of Scripture and then leave them behind in this room when we walk out that door when our service finishes. So cast your eyes on this past week. Think for a moment, how has this week been shaped by the knowledge of these mighty acts of God? How much has your heart been pulled by what the world chases after? What is the idol that is pulling in your heart? How much of your heart is spent worrying about money, 
for example? How much of your heart is consumed by worrying about your appearance, for example? How easy is it to forget that God has delivered you out of the domain of darkness? Now cast your eyes over the past week. Think for a moment how the decisions you have made, how has the point of view that you have used been shaped by the knowledge of these mighty acts of God? Have you been discontent with your life? Have you compared yourself with other people and been jealous of the things that, because they have things so much better than you do? How easy is it to forget that God has transferred you to the kingdom of his son? Cast your eyes back on the past week and think for a moment. How have the, has the way that you've related to other people, to the people who you work with, to your family, been influenced by the knowledge of these saving acts of God? Did you ask yourself this morning, why do I have to go to church? Have you been unexcited to serve at church? Have you been reluctant to be a witness for Jesus and share how God has worked in your life? How easy is it to forget that God has redeemed you, redeemed you into his family, into his church? Now cast your eyes to the week to come. Think of the things that you will need to do and the people that you will need to relate to. How do, you, how do these things should, how should they be shaped by the knowledge of these saving acts of God? Are you going to avoid talking to your Christian brother and sister? Are you going to refuse to forgive them because of the hurt that they've caused you? How easy is it to forget that God has forgiven you? Now think of what happens after church this morning as we fellowship together. How do you think they should be shaped by the knowledge of these saving acts of God. The Lord God is the real hero in this passage this morning. The Lord God has always been the one and will always be the one who fights for and delivers his people. Jesus is the hero. He has saved you out of sin and into the kingdom of his son. So let's not easily forget what God has saved us from. Let us not easily forget what God has saved us for. And in doing so, let us encourage each other to see God's salvation be lived out in our lives. And as we live out our salvation, let us encourage each other. Let us know and be encouraged that God, the living God, will work in us to live out that salvation. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you so much that you have demonstrated your awesome power through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, help us to be reminded, to be shaped, uh, to be transformed uh, by you, the living God, that we would give our praise and glory uh, because you have saved us and delivered us out of sin and into your kingdom. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.